this year and at this time in this season we have so much work to do and I'm not going to cry we have chains all over not just in this church not just in our houses and on our hearts and on our minds and on all the things that keep us from that very thing that God wants for us, which is freedom. Freedom in Him, not in this world, not in a good magazine, not in a good talk show host. We have freedom in Christ alone. We don't have to run, y'all. We don't have to run to anything outside of what He has for us. So this year, this morning, when we're talking about breaking chains, we're going to talk to the chains that are holding us back this year. This is your year to let God use you. There is one of you, and you have the perfect gift that God gave to you for this time, and this day, and this season. And we're going to ask Him this morning to break the chain. There's no reason to let him hold us back anymore. We don't let him let us go. So you guys sing with me this morning. And let's break some chains. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. 
that that would bless you it speaks to every one of us and I want to talk this morning about the spiritual privilege of the perfection of the believer the spiritual privilege of perfection of the believer God is always perfecting us he's never making us less than what he intended for us to be it's always a progressive forward process you're going to be better tomorrow than you are today. You may not act like it. You may not feel like it. But in reality, you are going to be better tomorrow than you are today in your good standing with God. Already in God's standing, you're as good as you will ever be. Because now you have access to Him as a believer and part of His family. You cannot be more part of His family than you are now. You cannot be more saved than you are now. Even though you might not act like you're saved right now, or you might not even feel like you're saved right now. If you ever once made a true profession of faith in Christ and decided to follow Christ, and you accepted Jesus in your heart and realized that you were a sinner, then you were saved for all eternity. The Holy Spirit came to live in you, and He abides forever, the Scripture says. He never leaves or abandons you in your time of need or in your time of trouble. God is always ever-present. And He is perfecting you. The perfection of the believer is quite a privilege. 
I couldn't have found a better clip that, that demonstrated and communicated how God chisels away the things in our life to make us a more perfect uh, masterpiece. I like to say it this way, and I haven't said it in a long time. You can be pure, perfect, and holy. Now, a lot of people get all cringy with that, but I want you to understand you can be as pure as you ever choose to be. God will never hinder that process. You can be as complete or perfect as you ever choose to be. It's an ever-present cycle. It's an uh, ever-ongoing cycle. It's a progressive revelation cycle. But your perfection is always in the process in God's uh, economy of how He shapes and molds us. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He makes us better tomorrow than what we'll be today by the experiences that we experience today. Thus, we'll be better tomorrow. The Holy Spirit is in us, and the Holy Spirit will make us conscious of what happened today so that we will be better tomorrow. Even though we don't act on tomorrow, we will have the help that we need whenever we call on the help. So I can be as pure, as pure and perfect as holy as I choose to be. God will never say, hey... Mike, I'm going to stop you being holy today. You're too holy for me. I don't think you need to be any more holy. And that simply means set apart. Mike, you're not going to be any more complete than you are today. I think you're as complete as that the world can handle. No, God's going to allow me to be as complete as my soul desires. He will give me the desire of my heart. If my desire is to dwell in the house of the Lord forever and to be ever present with Him, then that, that's what God is going to allow me to be. Pure, perfect, and holy. The perfection of the believer. I want you to turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter number 10. might be a difficult passage for some, but it's one of the most encouraging texts in the entire Bible. A text preceded by great news. Uh, we find that in chapter uh, number 9 and, and the first part of number 10, that we find forgiveness is available for everyone who wants forgiveness. I want you to understand, if you today feel like you're outside the economy of God and sin has separated you from God, or maybe you've never called on God, let me tell you, forgiveness is available. And forgiveness is not in saying or making the statement, God, I'll be good, because you'll never be good enough. God, I'll try better. It's not because no matter how hard you try, you're going to fall short. The Bible says that we all fall short of the glory of God. We'll never be able to attain that. It has to be that we receive God's gift after we've recognized that we need God. And we need our sins forgiven. But the text prior to what we're looking at today, forgiveness is available. And the way we got our forgiveness is that God sent Jesus, His only begotten Son, to bear our sins, to be the payment for our sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we find that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And in the Old Testament, that what they would do, they would offer up animals uh, every time there was a, a, a going to the temple for any sin that they had committed, and the sacrifice of an animal would have to be uh, the atonement for one's sin. But boy, that was a frail thing. You had to, something had to die every time you messed up. Something wrong with that picture, because I mess up a lot. And when I messed up, that meant I'd, I was without the forgiveness of God. And if something happened in between, then what was my hope if I didn't make the payment at the time that I committed the sin after I previously made another sacrifice? In other words, I'm always searching for salvation or trying to be good enough. I'm not really able to live life because I'm always working to try to keep laws and rules and regulations. And that certainly didn't work. But the blood of Christ was sufficient that we find, and I'll tell you about it in a little bit. Not only that, in the Old Testament, as we read the book of Hebrews, because it was written to the Hebrews, people that understood the Old Testament process, it's really a book about people trying to reconcile what used to be and what now is. What used to be and now is. It used to be an old covenant, but now there's a new and better way. The old covenant meant that we had to keep rules, regulations, and laws, and commandments, and all of those things. And Jesus said when He came in, He said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to be the fulfillment of it. But He also said, if you break one commandment, you've broken them all. The 638 commandments that were in the Levitical law, and you know the Ten Commandments, and you know some other things. But Jesus gives the commandments too, but they have no reference to that. He didn't come to destroy it, He came to be the fulfillment of it. 
And it's the fulfillment of it with a new and better way. He's going to destroy the Old Testament sacrificial system because he's going to die once and once for all for the sins of everyone. That blood cannot be applied unless you receive it. But the payment was made for anyone, anyone who ever wanted to call on the name of the Lord. Anyone that realized they were a sinner. So, and, and in the Old Testament, the high priest would offer the atonement for sin once a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. He would go in into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God, and he would offer uh, a blood from a lamb that was without spot, without blemish, for the atonement of the entire nation. But Christ is our high priest with a new and better way. And the Holy Spirit is always working for us as we look at this text. This text centers around the family of God. It centers around the family of God. You're going to hear the phrase, let us. Let us. It speaks of fellowship in the body of Christ. I want you to understand, God is working on all of us because, see, we and us are two important people that the Holy Spirit needs to speak to. We and us. It's important. It, we and us are who this is addressed to. And these two people, we and us, need each other. And when we and us come together, we're a powerful source. And God is not only perfecting me, He's protecting us. And we, being perfected, can accomplish something great for God. I want you to understand what he's talking about as we're able to look at it, because let us, as we look at the text, will speak of fellowship in the body of Christ. It ties earthly fellowship to heavenly anticipation. Now, boy, if we ever need good news, we need it now. We need it now. So I want to give you five things, and I'm going to move very, very quickly so that I can keep up to my pledge to try to finish at a, at a reasonable time. But my, my interpretation of reasonable might be different than your interpretation of reasonable, so I don't really see I can lose on this thing. Uh, here's the first thing I want you to write down. We are benefiting together in the same truth, okay? Now, in Hebrews chapter number 10, this is important, and, I, and I'm kind of going to pick up really with, with verse number 11. Uh, it says this, and, and, and there's, there's a, a lot here that we, that we probably really need to look at as we talk about uh, the first part of the animal sacrifices that I kind of summarized in the first part of chapter 10, and then how that Christ's death fulfills God's will. Uh, verse 5 says, Therefore, when He came into the world, He said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In other words, Christ says, you, didn't, you weren't looking for a bunch of sacrifices when I came, but we took on the form of a body, that the body could, when I came, sacrifice really showed up. And I'm going to make the sacrifice. By the way, no one took Jesus' life. He willingly lays it down. He's going to offer himself without spot, without blemish, as John the Baptist testified, the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world, the Lamb of God, He's going to offer it up for our sacrifice. So, we are benefiting together. We, we are benefiting together in the same truth. The truth that gets me to heaven is the same truth that gets you to heaven. The truth that helps you get through the day is the truth that helps me get through the day. The truth is for us and for we. It's important that we understand the sufficiency of His sacrifice. And look at verse number 11. It says this, And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Talking about the old covenant, talking about the old way, talking about how when man failed, it said that the priest had to stand every day repeatingly offering sacrifice for sins. What happens if you're in between the sacrifice? Do you die and go to hell because there's, there, there's no payment for your sin? What a risk that would be. You couldn't have assurance in that. You'd have no confidence in that. You'd have even no hope in that. You, you'd be wondering and fretting all the time you would be you would you think your anxiety is bad now imagine what it would be like if you thought you could lose your salvation at the very point you committed a sin and you say well what do you quantify as sin the bible says that he who knows to do right and doesn't do right to him it becomes a sin your attitude can be a sin 
Your language can be a sin. The way you dress can be a sin. The way you walk can be a sin. Who you're with and how you're with them can be a sin. You can violate God's Word with the way you talk, the way you walk, all of those things. You can, you can subconsciously even break God's law. You can do it. We're so conditioned to the world that sometimes we don't think about things, and when we do them, we say, I can't believe I said or did that. Subconsciously. Wouldn't it be an awful, terrible thing if we had to have a sacrifice made for each one of those offenses? But look at verse 12. Verse 12 says this. And by the way, he says, which can never take away sins. Verse 12, but this man. Everybody say this man. This man is the Lord Jesus Christ. After he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, set down at the right hand from God, uh, of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever. Perfected forever. Those who are being sanctified. The perfecting of the saints. Do you understand when God looks at you, just as that clip said, Yeah, that sounds great, a masterpiece, but I know I'm not a masterpiece. When God looks at you, he sees a masterpiece. When God looks at you, He sees the finished work. Aren't you glad that God doesn't look at you and see your sin? He paid your sin debt. When you receive Christ, He paid your sin debt. Sin's not charged you anymore. You're not under the penalty of sin. For the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The perfecting of the saints. What a spiritual privilege that is. Man, I don't have to walk all tied up in a knot. I don't have to chew my fingernails off. I don't have to sit there wondering if I'm saved. Look, if the blood has been applied, I, I know because the Word of God says I'm saved. The sufficiency of His sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 and 28. When you get time, go back and read it. I highlight it in my Bible, and it says this, "...as it is appointed for men to die once." But after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly await for Him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. In other words, the final aspect of our salvation is going to be done. Those of us that are saved, we, we, we certainly are looking forward to glorification, aren't we? Glorification. We've had justification. We've been justified in the eyes of God. We have sanctification as the Holy Spirit is setting us apart. And glorification is going to come when we see Jesus face to face. When we leave this mortal body and become immortal, the spiritual crowning event that's going to happen in our life when we get a new body and we become glorified as He is. And by the way, we're waiting for that. It's the redemption in its totality to come. But let me tell you this, in God's eyes, it's already done. In God's eyes, there's nothing that can stop it. You are going to be glorified with a new body. Your eternal home is going to be heaven if you're a believer today. And you don't have to worry. John the Baptist's declaration in John 1 29, let me read this to you. You don't even need to turn. I'll read it quickly. It'll save us a little bit of time. In John 1 29, it simply says this, as we read through the Scripture, and it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is He of whom I said, After, he comes, after, he, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. Verse 31, I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. Verse 32. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. Now Matthew says, not only did the Spirit come, but Matthew says that they heard a voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Verse 33. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with water the Holy Spirit. And he says, And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. John the Baptist. Jesus said about John the Baptist, He was the greatest man born of woman. There was nobody that was greater than John the Baptist ever born of a woman. And Jesus said this was His testimony. The Holy Spirit's witness to us. We can know personally that we have this perfect standing with God. 
The Holy Spirit bears witness to us. It's one of those things that, that is absolutely phenomenal when it comes. The, the witness of the Holy Spirit, as we read in verse number 15, as we look at this, he says this uh, as we, we moved on. Verse 15, it says, But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. The Holy Spirit reminds us that our sins are remembered no more. We've seen it by the witness of the work of God, the witness of the, the work of the Son, the witness of the Spirit. The new covenant believer can say that his sins and iniquities are remembered no more. I love Psalms 103.12. You're going to see it on the screen. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions. So we come together, us and we, with this truth, the same truth that we all have, as we see God perfecting the saints. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what the Scripture says. But the devil will want to try to tell you something different. The world will try to tell you something different. The world will make fun of you and mock you and try to make you feel ashamed that you're a believer, try to make you feel bad that you follow Christ, try to make you feel bad that you believe the Word of God. They'll say it's a cult. They'll say all these other things. But the Bible says that the Holy Spirit and that God the Father is perfecting the saints, taking the things away that get in our way, that hinder us from being what we need to be. Let me give you the second thing. We are drawn together in the same assurance, not only the same truth, but the same assurance in verse number 22 as we look. This is one of those good verses too. Verse 22 says this, And let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Full assurance. Let us draw near. That, that's not just me. That's just not for the pastor and the staff to be really studious and draw near to God. Let us draw near. When Paul writes to the Hebrews, and I believe he wrote it, and that might be up for debate, but I'll probably come out on top on that debate, but we don't have a, a, a defining author who it is, but it doesn't matter. We know the Holy, Holy Spirit wrote it as it was inspired by whoever was able to pin it down. But the emphasis is, let us draw near. Not just me, not just the writer, not me, the pastor, but let everyone in this building draw near. Let us draw near in full assurance. Uh, assurance, what a good word. What a good Bible word. Somebody say, are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. I am sure. Assurance, no faltering, no doubt. And I know doubt is good sometimes, but listen to me, at the end of the day, if you doubt, here's what you're going to find out. If you doubt that you're saved, you know what you're going to find out? You're going to find out that you really are saved. Because if you, if you have doubt and you come to God and say, God, am I really saved? You know what God's going to say? If you're not sure, get saved now. And you'll have assurance. He'll never turn you away. He'll never say, oh, because you doubted, I'm not going to have you. No, 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 no. Everybody doubts. Everybody has that. But when it comes to what God did with the sacrifice, He did it once and for all. And you're still going to sin. But He paid every sin that you will ever commit. Your past sin, your present sin, and all your future sins. He did it once and for all. And He sat down at the right hand of God the Father. He did it. So we can come with full assurance. A good Bible word. A, a word that removes all doubts. A word that eliminates uncertainty. Now, I don't know about you, but in this particular time where we are with COVID, the world, I mean, the world is jacked up. Woo. I mean, wars, rumors of wars, Russia, China, Syria, Israel, all the things that are going on in Texas and Dallas alone, a Jewish synagogue, you got terrorists there. It's all around us. Wars and rumors of wars, pestilence, tornadoes. Uh, tsunamis, you've got earthquakes, you've got all of these things going on, and sometimes we're not even aware. I don't know about you, but boy, we, we need some certainty today. Because that creates an atmosphere of uncertainty. And what Satan wants us to have is an attitude of uncertainty to where it affects us so much, and it does affect some people that they won't even come to church. They lose hope. They're uncertain about this Jesus thing. 
It sounds hard to hear, but it's true. You know, even the Bible says that in the last days there'll be a great falling away. And they ask, when will these things be? It's, it, with all the signs that you look at, the same statement about the great falling away will be there. It'll be there. But this word, let us draw near with full assurance, assurance eliminates uncertainty. If you're sure, listen to me, let, all this stuff is going to go on, but it's not going to change what God is doing. It's not going to change my heavenly home. It's not going to change the fact that if I leave this world tomorrow, I'll be in a better place. It's not going to change the fact that my hope is not in the world. It's not in the political system. It's not in a vaccine. My hope is in Him. Look, do you understand? Even your health is not reliant upon a vaccine or a cure. Your health is reliant on Him. Because He's much more powerful than any vaccine or cure. He's still a miracle-working God. And He still takes care of His people. And I'm not trying to say, don't disregard the other stuff. You've got good wisdom. And they're good believers that are in the medical field. And Luke was a doctor, and I'm certainly going to listen to my doctor. But my hope is still in him at the end of the day. Because, listen to me, if the cure doesn't work, he's still on the throne. And he's waiting on me to get there. And the promises will be true. See, our Lord wants to ha us to have full assurance. A true heart is filled with with assurance. No drawing back by faith. Just look at verse 35 and 39. I, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. He says this. He says, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance. Need of endurance. You know what the word in the Greek for endurance is? Hupomone. Hupomone. You know what it means? Marathon. You know what they're running in Houston today? The Houston Marathon. A 26-mile, I mean, enduring kind of run that you got to, 26.3 miles. You gotta, it's, it's a long run. you got to train. you got to do it. Very few people can just go run 26 miles without training. And he says you have confidence. The way we're going to make this life work is to have confidence in God. We're going to run that marathon, not a sprint. A lot of good sprinters in the Christian faith we got some world record Christian faith sprinters. They run good for a little while, and at the end of this marathon race, we wonder, where are they at? Oh, they quit at mile two. Where are they at? Oh, they quit at mile four. Where are they at? Oh, they started out really good. They were leading the pack, but they fell out at mile ten. You, those, listen to me, the perfecting of the saints as God chisels away and as God is working on us to be pure, perfect, and holy, we can come with the same assurance that God is still working. This confidence is there. And a true heart is filled just by that. He says, look, therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. And here's the promise for yet a little while. He who is coming will who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just will live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure. You know what draws back means? You start backsliding. You start losing that confidence. You start saying, God's not going to finish this thing. He's the author and the finisher of what we do. He's chiseling away. You say, well, I stumbled. I fall. I let God down. You didn't fool God. God knew exactly what you were going to do. He wasn't dis I mean, you, you, you might disappoint, but, but God knew exactly what was going to happen. That's why all things work together for good, because He has a plan even after you mess up. He has a plan, because He's perfecting the saints. You can come with full assurance. Anything less would not be full assurance. It's important that we understand it. And the blood of Christ purges the believer's conscience. Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serving the living God? See, it's your conscience that God is even working. When we mess up, let me just say this. You, you probably won't agree with it, but it won't be the first time you hadn't agreed with something I said. Sometimes you messing up is the greatest thing that ever happened to you. Sometimes you messing up, falling down, busting your... Mm, is sometimes the best thing that ever happened to you. 
Because your conscience truly begins to work when you really mess up. To not just to where you say, I'm sorry, but then you come with godly sorrow. The Holy Spirit now has absolutely got you where He wants you, where you now are, are void of anything of self, and you say, God, I totally need you. Listen to me. Just because you made some mistakes along the way, that doesn't define you. What defines you is the perfecting work of God Himself in your life. Those are learning experiences. Those are experiences of life that, that, that you look back on that are great lessons. Those are great signs of redemption. Those are great pictures of forgiveness. Those are great pictures of acceptance. Those are great pictures of God's love. Those are great pictures of renewal. Those are great pictures of, of embracing God and God embracing you. Those are great pictures of humility. Those are great lessons of learning. Those are great lessons of knowledge. Those are great lessons of testimony. Here's a testimony. Not that you're proud of what you did, but the, how God picked you up, set your feet on the solid rock, pulled you from the miry clay, and said, this is my beloved, and this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And listen to me, you can hear well pleased again, and well done again. We can come with assurance, because see, we have, we have that hope in us. Full assurance, what a good word. Also, we are held together in the same hope, verse 23. Let us hold fast that profession of our faith. i got to go back. Look at verse number 23. Let us hold fast again, us. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Believing our beliefs, doubting our doubts. That means we hold tight. Doubt your doubts. You'll find the answers you're looking for them. Because truth will happen. Truth will always expose itself. See, if you believe your beliefs, doubting your doubts. When I have doubt, I start to doubt that I even believe that, that, that I even doubt something. When my belief is strong, when the doubt comes, I doubt the doubt. You said, can that make sense? Yeah. The enemy will come in and say, you're not worthy. I doubt that. I know I sin. Well, don't, don't, don't you know because of your sin you should doubt your salvation? I doubt that. I doubt that because of what he did. I doubt that. I doubt that you're being truthful. Because I know God is true because we stand on the same truth and every man a liar. And I know Satan was a liar and a murderer from the beginning, and he wants to corrupt the Word of God and take the redemptive part out, the forgiveness part out, the restoration part out, and the forgiveness part out, and the part that says, uh, Lord, uh, I need to repent. He wants to take it out. No, when I make a mistake and when I mess up, I doubt the doubt because I know God's Word is true. I doubt that that's true. People say, I just, I, I, I'm just not sure I'm saved. I say, I doubt that. Because you are saved. If you've accepted Christ. See, here is unwavering confidence. Based on the finished work of Christ. 928, for he was once offered for the remission of sin. Resting on his resurrection and his return. Sins are forgiven. Heaven is sure. Now, now it, it's just, it wouldn't make sense for God to promise us something and then not allow it to happen. It just wouldn't make sense. He is faithful. A promise is only good by the one who makes the promise. And God, God has made all of these precious promises that we should have. Let us hold fast our profession of faith because He is faithful. Read the verse. Look at the verse. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for He who promised is faithful. Why in the world would you ever doubt God? We only want to doubt God when we get into trouble and our trouble is so overwhelming we think God's not there. Look, when you get into trouble, the, the most proficient picture you should see is God. You say, how do I really find Him when I try to muddle through all the muck that I got myself in? Cry help. Cry repenting. God help me. And it doesn't even have to be a loud cry. God help me. That still, small voice of God will speak back and say, I'm already here. 
I'm already here. You didn't shock God. What God wants is for us to be ever present in His presence, even when we mess up. Let me give you the fourth thing. We are working together in the same love, verse 24. I love this too. This is a great text. And let us consider one another. Let us consider one another in the same love. Now, look, we talked about the same hope. We talked about the assurance of faith come with full assurance. We talked about the same truth. And now, all of a sudden, we're talking about the same love. Let us consider one another. We have, look at the sequence, truth, faith, hope, and love. Truth, faith, hope, and love. That's why I believe it's a Pauline epistle, because in 1 Corinthians 13, what does he write about love? He writes about faith, hope, and love. Let us come together in the same love. Let us consider one another. Too many people right now in today's time are not considering one another. Do you know there are 31 another, one another's in the New Testament? 31! 31! Jesus said a new commandment that I give unto you, John 13, 34, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's one of them. There are 30 more one another's. Encourage one another. Pray for one another. Forgive one another. Hold one another in high esteem. I mean, meet one another's needs. Show hospitality to one another. Go research them and look what the one another's are about. You, see, when you get saved, when you become part of the family of God, it's we and us. It's no longer me. Amen. We and us. Whatever God does for me, He's doing it for me so that you can benefit from. It's, it's, it's we and us. Whatever you do, and I need some of you to provoke me. We are working together in the same love. Let us consider one another. Let's go back and look at this because this is a good verse. One of my favorite verses. This is good. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love. Everybody say love. We consider one another on how can we love one another better. How can we love one another better? How can I minister to you in an attitude of love? How can I show you the love of God? Love becomes the, the, the main issue. Love is considerate of others. Love considers and provokes more love. Look at this. This is a great verse to stir up love and good works. I'm to consider you, and you're to consider me, for love and good works. In other words, I'm thinking, how can I show you some good work, and how can I get you to do some good work? It stirs it up. It provokes it. It's one of those things that it does. It's, it's, it's one of those, those great, great verses. And, you know, if I had time, we'd read uh, Acts 2, 41 and, and, and through 46. But it affects any congregation. Simply put, if you go back and read that, it'd say they broke bread every day together. And they had fellowship with one another. And they prayed, and they followed the apostles' doctrine and teaching. That's what they did. The early church was a church that was bound together by love and unity. It's what they did. And they came together every day. Every day. I'm trying to get you to come two days a week. They came together every day. And nobody put a time limit on the preacher. Paul preached one time and he preached to midnight and a man fell off the top of the house. He preached along. He fell asleep, but they never stopped the meeting. They, Paul went over, raised him up, and they continued on with the meeting. And nobody complained. And nobody went home and said, well, that was too long. I really like going there, but it's too long. They provoked one another to good works. It's one of those good things because... They were held together in the same love, and they're working together in the same, I mean, in the same hope, and they're working together in the same love as we consider one another, working together. You know, I'm not on Facebook Live right now, and I know this will be posted. We're, we're, we're contemplating getting better equipment so we can go back maybe to Facebook Live. But let me just say this. It's not to let you stay home where you can watch at home. It's only for those who are really going to, to have a deficiency in coming a shut-in, or you can't come, or you're sick. And we understand the need that you want to see it. But you will see what we're doing today in about three or four days. The guys take care of it. But listen to me. I, I need people here.
to provoke me. Amen. Amen. That's good. I, I, I need, and it's in love. I'm a preacher of the gospel. I, I, I study and study and study. I study when most people are taking time off. I study at home. I study in the car. Phyllis will go into Michael's. I'm studying. I look at the, on my phone. I'm looking just to keep my mind. I don't study like super deep, but I'm looking constantly to keep my mind ever present in the Word of God. And when I show up ready to open my heart and my mind and whatever God has given me, and I see the house full, I am provoked to good works. And with love that people will sacrifice and come. And I'm giving you love knowing that I'm preparing everything that I can prepare so God can speak to your heart through the Holy Spirit. That you won't leave here void of anything that might help you in facing what's going on in the world. We're provoking one another unto good works. It's important. It's one of those things that's so good as we begin to look at it. So we come together. We come together in the same truth. We come together in the, the, the assurance of our faith. We come together in the same hope. We come together in the same love. And then we meet together in the same anticipation. And when you get here, you do anticipate to hear from God. You, you expect those singers to sing their behinds off. You like it when Justin, and I know what you're thinking, he'll get up here and he'll hit a high note, and it's not his part. I mean, he'll hit a high note and he'll just start like letting it rip a little bit, and then he'll, he'll like lasso it back in. I'm saying, man, let the horse run, brother. Let the horse run. When you want to go, just ride that pony till that pony don't ride no more. Amen? That's what you need to do. Or Dawn's leading in a song. Here's Dawn. She's leading in a song. And it's kind of where the drums are playing and the music's playing. And there's that interlude. And you can hear her hold the mic way back here. And her spirit will be groaning those hallelujahs, those amens. And what you're really thinking in your mind and in your heart is put that microphone up and let it rip. Amen. Just come on and let the Holy Ghost get all over you and provoke us to a good work. Provoke us with what God has shown you. What God has told you, just like she did before the song, you were provoked. You were ready. You were anticipating. You had full assurance that God was going to move through that song instead of <laughs> provoke one another to good works. We got assurance. We got confidence. We got hope. We got love. We're not here to hurt anybody. We're here to help everybody. You understand what I'm saying? Provoking one. I'm provoking you right now. I shouldn't have to yell to provoke you. But most of us are conditioned that I'm not going to move until somebody yells. Look, if I use your middle name, you know you're in trouble. Amen? Most of us didn't come in when Mama come to the door and said, Hey, time for supper. We'd wait three or four times. And then she'd yell and she'd throw in that middle name, you know, you better hurry up and get in the house. Amen? You might not get no supper. You might get a switch. Sometimes, I want you to see this in the next verse, God has whispered for everybody to come back in the house. And not everybody's come. He's whispered. But let me just say this. You don't want God to have to yell. You don't want God to have to get his switch. Mm-mm. Because this is a great text. Now look at this next verse. We meet together in the same anticipation. For let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Verse 25. Not forsaking. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another. That's encouraging one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Look, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. If all of these signs that are going on 
that we talked about. And I didn't teach on them, but I can teach on them, and I have taught on them. You know as well as I do that what's going on in the world today, everything is mentioned in Scripture. The exact order and process, yes, we'll teach and we'll help you delineate how it's going to happen, but there's no doubt things are happening that are supernatural right now. No doubt. No doubt. That's why it causes us to stir and to have anxiety. It's not the norm. We understand it. And that points, if those things are happening, then the next great event will be the rapture of the church, which sets everything in order. And after the rapture of the church, we're all going to stand before God at the Bema seat. And if you don't get raptured at the church, let me just say this, there won't be any hope for you in the Great Tribulation if you've heard the truth. Your day of grace will be over. You've had ample opportunity. That's another teaching, but it's true. That's why today is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time. Because, see, not forsaking the assembling, the importance of believers gathering for worship is that we do know that Christ could come again. And as we gather for worship, look, as we gather, we learn to gather more people to the house of God. We learn more about the economy of God. Here's the economy of God. We come so that we can go get. We come so that we can go get. What do we go get? Other people. The problem's not with the harvest. The problem is the laborers to go get the harvest. You bring them, they'll get saved. You bring them, God will do a work. As we are provoking one another, not forsaking the assembling. Don't let people tell you. Look, I have people say, well, I had company come over, and, and they don't go to church. So I didn't come today. Now, I'm going to be ugly. I'd just say, tell your company, we're going to church. And I'm going to take you to Popeye's after we're done and get you all the chicken or churches, and you go to the buffet and get all you want. But we're going to go, we're going to, go to my church and watch this crazy guy, and we're going to hear some great music, and we're going to experience love together. Just come on and go. Just try it. You'll like it. Come and see. Come and see. Instead of saying, well... Okay, let's just all sleep in today, and I'll fix us some waffles, and we'll have a good brunch together. Scripture says, don't you forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Provoking one another is just not provoking saved people. It's provoking lost people that don't know the Lord, to get them to come. You say, I don't like that verse. I knew you wouldn't, but I do. Amen. We need each other. The importance of believers gathering for worship. Look, wouldn't it be great if every seat was full? You know what it would do? Your confidence would go from here to here. Your confidence would be at a level. You would leave here saying, oh my gosh, God moved today. The house was full. The worship was great. It was, I could just feel the presence of God. That's what you would do. Your confidence would grow because everybody provoked one another and everybody showed up and everybody the Holy Spirit spoke to. Listen to me, God, will, His Word will never go out void. Anybody that comes is going to benefit. We need each other. We meet to provoke the King James uses the term provoke. I like the old King James. I do. That 1611 is hard to beat. New King James says that, that, uh, that we reason together. I like provoke. That's a good word. That's kind of in my, my territory. I'll provoke you. I'll prod you. I'll nudge you in the ribs. I'll, 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 even, I'll even, if you sit next to me, I might reach over and grab your hand and say, hey, you want to go forward? Hey, you want to get saved today? I'll go with you. That's, that's provoke. That can be reason too, but provoke has a little bit more action. In other words, hey, come on, go with me. Let's go. If they pull back your hand, you'll know they don't want to go, but nine times out of ten, they'll go with you. 
You say, oh, that's man-led. Oh, you think so? I promise you, somewhere between that seat and down here, it'll be a God thing. By the time they get down here, tears will be streaming down their face, and they'll be hugging your neck for bringing them. We need to provoke. We need to preach with some passion. Stir up. Encourage one another. We need to find comfort in our Lord's return, not anxiety. I have people that come to me and say, Pastor, I, you know, I'm worried about all this, and I want to see my kid do this, and I want to see this happen, and I want to see this. I said, look, I know those are natural things, but let me just say this. If the Lord comes back today, you'll see more than you ever thought that would be there, and it'll be more beautiful than anything you'll ever experience in this world. You won't even think twice about what you miss because of what you'll get. He'll be the completeness of everything about us with glorification. Some will neglect gathering as Christ comes approach. The return of Christ should make us eager together. It should make us more encouraged. And if Jesus came today, we're going to find that some folk are not here. I want to hear well done. I know some people are sick, and I know some people are scared. I, I, I know all that. I do. But there are some other folks who just can got in the habit that's just where it's going to be. They ain't coming. Boy, we need to provoke them. We need to call and encourage them. Hey, get your mind back over here, man. God loves you. God's, God's chiseling that thing away. He's doing it. So what do we do? You know, I, I was, <coughs> being a military guy, I served my time in the service, and it was a great, great time. I do it again every time. Uh, my father-in-law retired from the Navy. He, he spent, gosh, 40 something years in government service uh, he was an e8 in the navy and we talked sometimes i said what 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 would you do every time you heard that uh, 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 and then you heard the word everybody battle stations battle stations uh, uh, uh. i said what would y'all do I said, what, what, would everybody? He said, it didn't matter what shift you were on, it didn't matter what bunk you were in, it didn't matter. Every person on that ship had a battle station. And every person had to get up, no matter what. It, you, you, see, nobody's off duty when battle happens. And they would hear, uh, 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 battle stations, battle stations, everybody ready. I said, everybody in the whole ship? He said, everybody, nobody was left in a bunk. Nobody was in the mess hall. Nobody was anywhere. Everybody ran, whether they were dressed or undressed, to their battle stations because every battle station was critical for protection of the ship. Nobody could be off. Don't you think that we're in a battle today? I wish I had a buzzard. Everybody had it home. And I could punch it every Monday. <laughs> battle stations. When we're out in the world, we're doing battle. That's why we can't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. I know this. We win. We win because of what he did. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity just to come to your house today. And Father, my prayer is this, simply this. If there's anyone here today and they're not saved, today would be their day. I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to hearts here today for those that are not sure if they're saved. For those who are saved, Father, I just, I just want them to understand they're being perfected. It's a spiritual privilege. You are constantly making us better. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, through the work of Jesus, and through just the character and, 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 and nature of who you are, you're a good, loving God. And Father, I just pray this morning for that individual that don't know Christ, that they would be their day. Speak to their heart. And look, before I say amen, with every head bowed and every eye closed, is there someone here today, is there anyone here today, that's not sure if you're saved and you'd like to say I want to trust Christ as my Savior I want to have that assurance that you're talking about I want to, I want to know for sure I go to heaven I want, I want to receive what Christ did for me is there anyone I'm going to be brief don't, don't put this off deal with it now if, if you're not sure and you'd like to receive Christ today just right where you're at I know this is going to be hard just stand up 
You're not going to come forward. Just stand up right where you're at. Is there anybody like that? The Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. The Holy Spirit is saying, receive Christ today. The Holy Spirit is saying, Christ died for you. Just stand up where you're at. All right. I don't see anyone. There is one standing. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Mr. Jim, would you just simply go and just say a word of prayer over, over them and just tell them how much Christ loved them? There, there was a mature lady that stood up and wants to receive Christ. Is there someone else? I'm not going to stop if the Holy Spirit is speaking to heart. Someone, just stand up right where you're at. I'm not going to have you come forward. I'm not going to put you on the spot. I'm not going to call you by name. This is a personal thing. Just stand up right where you're at. I just want to send somebody to pray with you. We've had one. No one else? Young person? Old person? Middle-aged person? Person that thinks you got it together? When you really don't? You're like that guy, Tommy, who was being chiseled away? Just stand. Father, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for this sweet lady that stood, that the Holy Spirit spoke to. We thank you for all of us as we maybe today have grown a little bit knowing that you are perfecting us and that you are constantly making us better. We praise you. We thank you for it. We thank you for the Word of God. And we thank you for the moving of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you guys so much. Please come on Wednesday as we look at spiritual gifts one more time. It's been great what we're doing. And, and again, be back next week. I love you. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here.